Hello again, Periscope. Welcome to the third and final of our Museum Week Periscopes from the British Museum. Uh, we just ended about 10 minutes ago. I Hopefully you guys saw it. If not, you can watch it later. We were with Irving Finkel learning about cuneiform and uh, pretty much just the history of language generally. Now for the final thing, we decided to take you to what is probably the most popular and definitely most heavily populated uh, gallery during the daytime. It's, it can sometimes be quite hard to you know, get up and close and personal with the objects. It's empty right now, except for one person in particular who, uh, who knows it probably better than anyone else. So I'm gonna pass you on to the curator of the Egyptian Sculpture Gallery, Marcel, to take you through Egyptian. So hello everyone, uh, so I'm Marcel, I am indeed the curator of this wonderful gallery uh, which consists of um, Egyptian monuments from a period of about 3,000 years, unbelievably, covering the whole of pharaonic history from the um, early moments of the unification of the country to uh, the Greco-Roman period. Uh, what I will do is show you some highlights, of course there's only so much we can cover, but to give you an impression of how all this is organized and how beautiful this gallery really is. Um, in the first section of the gallery, we are looking at typical Egyptian monuments that give you a sense of kingship ideology, uh, the Egyptian religion and Egyptian art. Um, we are standing in front of two wonderful uh, granodiorite statues that were created in the 14th century BC for a king named Amenhotep. We call him Amenhotep III. Um, what we see here, the, the largest of the two statues, which is the best preserved, it, it, it is a perfect summary of what an Egyptian king was supposed to be. He was half human, half divine. He looks like eternally young. The features are very idealized not at all a true portrait of the king, but certainly a representation that he would have approved of. Uh, you can see he is wearing a, a headcloth, a pleated headcloth. Uh, there's a cobra on his forehead that is a symbol of divine protection. Unfortunately, the, uh, the cobra is rather damaged today. Uh, the king also originally had a long beard. Uh, you can see he's wearing a collar. And uh, on his belt, I will highlight that, um, is a small inscription that um, presents his uh, official names. His, um, his names are written inside cartouches, now partly damaged. Otherwise, he wears a pleated kilt, and uh, between his legs, you can in fact see a bull's tail, a ceremonial bull's tail that the king, that an Egyptian king would typically wear, at least at official occasions. Of course, the bull is a strong animal, and it's all to suggest the king's superhuman strength and power. Um, there are also inscriptions on the throne that he's seated on, um, along the, the front sides. Uh, again, it's mostly his names and all sorts of epithets. And then on the side of the throne, there's a, a symbol, again, of, of the king's power. Uh, it, it represents two plants. There's um, a bush of papyrus on the left, and of lilies on the right, and they've been tied together in a knot around a hieroglyph that, uh, whose meaning is unite, to unite. So the idea is that the king is here represented um, ruling over a united Egypt. Because, uh, what I should have mentioned, the papyrus and the lily are heraldic plants. They are um, emblems of upper and Lower Egypt, Upper Egypt being the Nile Valley and Lower Egypt, the Nile Delta. Now, um, on the back of the statue, I'll briefly mention that as well, there is a large monumental inscription, again, mostly consisting of uh, the king's full titulary, but also um, mentioning the deity um, to whom the temple was primarily dedicated, where these statues were erected. And what is interesting is that that deity, whose name was Amun, he was the chief god of the Egyptian pantheon, um, the name Amun has been um, erased from the original inscription and later restored on a deeper surface. If you look very carefully, you can see that this group, which represents a flowering reed, let me use a torch for that, a flowering reed, 
a gaming board with gaming pieces and a water ripple. These three signs together spell the name Amun. And what you can see um, in, the, in the gallery lighting, if you focus on this, that, that is that the name Amun always sits on a deeper surface, even within this oval, which contains the king's birth name, Amenhotep, which includes the name Amun, those signs were erased and later restored. And this is to do with events that took place shortly after Amenhotep's reign. Uh, his son and successor actually propagated the worship of only one god, and this is not Amun, but the sun god Aten. Um, so all over Egypt, on all monuments, statues, temple walls, etc., the name Amun was erased, and in fact the names of other deities were as well, even the word, um, uh, the, the word God, gods in the plural would be erased. But after the reign of that sort of heretic king, everything was turned back to normal, and all the damage that had been done had to be repaired, and this has evidently also happened on this statue here. Uh, it's a granodiorite. It's a hard, dark stone. Right. Well, um, we will now carry on to um, some other magnificent statues. Uh, there's a pair, in fact, of them. We will focus on the one on the right, but there are these two wonderful lions in red granite. They are actually from the same reign, so we are, st again, talking about the reign of Amenhotep III, who ruled, as I mentioned, in the 14th century BC. And what is particularly noteworthy about these lions is that they, they don't display the, the rectilinear frontality that we are so used to with Egyptian sculpture. Uh, this is a much more um, relaxed um, mode of representation. The, the, the lion is sort of reclined to one side and, in a way, looking rather relaxed. Um, but the interesting thing is that while we might think this is just a lion, it actually represents the king again. Again, this is Amenhotep III um, displaying his power. Um, of course, the sphinx, the, the, the human-headed lion, is a very familiar motif in Egyptian art. Um, and Egyptian sphinxes, as a rule, represent also the king as a, as a powerful creature. But in this case, a relatively rare example uh, the king is completely depicted as a lion. There is, in fact, an inscription on the mane of the lion that um, identifies the king as a, as a lion among rulers. You can actually see the hieroglyph of a lion there striding towards the right. As a lion among rulers um, who, um, who will sort of pound on his enemies, who, who will tread his path. Um, this statue and its pair were placed in a temple outside Egypt proper in a place called Solep. Uh, this is in modern-day Sudan, northern Sudan. Um, that region was conquered by the Egyptians and colonized. And in Solep, this Amenhotep king um, founded a completely new temple of which considerable remains still stand today, and these lions were part of its decoration. The lions, in fact, um, drew so much admiration that in a much later period, a thousand years, a thousand years later, a native king, because Egypt no longer ruled the region, but a native king appropriated these statues and move them another 500 kilometers up the Nile to decorate a palace in a city called Napata. How hard is it to read these characters? Um, well, it takes a long time to familiarize yourself with the uh, Egyptian hieroglyphic script. Um, basically, one year of very dedicated study will sort of teach you the basics, and of course you will have to keep practicing. Uh, for uh, most of Egyptian history, um, you get very far with knowledge of a few hundred signs, uh, but in, the, in the, the last stages of Egyptian history, ironically, while Egypt was already ruled by um, a Greek dynasty, uh, the hieroglyphic script was 
greatly expanded to a number of about 70,000 signs, and then, of course, the script becomes much more difficult to, um, to master. Well, moving on into the gallery, um, after this introduction to concepts of kingship, we enter the first great period of Egyptian history, the Old Kingdom. Um, we are now around the, um, well, this is the 25th century that we're going to look at. This monument here, this great door-shaped um, piece, it's from a tomb that was created, as I said, well, around 2400 BC, and it was intended, it was part of a chapel that remained permanently accessible to the living, but where they could bring offerings to the dead. Uh, in this case, the tomb belonged to a man named Tar Shepsis. If you look carefully at the top left, the far top left, you can see him depicted seated on a chair and his name is written right in front of him on the right in a, in a, in a column of hieroglyphs. Uh, Tashepsis was um, um, a high priest of the god Ta, who was very important at the time because Ta was the patron god of Memphis, which is Egypt's capital at the time. Um, but what is particularly interesting is that the inscriptions give us unique autobiographical details about the man's career. Uh, the text is to be read from right to left in columns, and it, it mentions, uh, probably originally, because part of the monument is now lost, but originally it may have mentioned as many as eight kings under whom he lived. He was born in the reign of a king whose name appears there, in, again in this familiar uh, cartouche, this oval shape, um, that is King Menka Ura, and... Um, Tarshepsis was, was brought up at the royal court and in the next reign, um, also represented here, uh, that's under King Ta, sorry, uh, Shepses Kaf, that's his cartouche, his, his, um, his name again in, enclosed for highlighting. Um, he married a royal daughter, a princess. Anyway, the story goes on and on, and I'm not going to explain every detail, but um, a rather amusing detail must be highlighted here. Um, this took place in the reign of a, of a king named Neferi Ka Ra. Um, this is around 2400 BC. And the king granted a very special favor, which is quite amusing to a modern um, listener, but here goes. If you follow me to the hieroglyphs, I'll show you what His Majesty granted. His Majesty, that's this group of signs here, um, in fact, it might work better without the torch. His Majesty would, would let him kiss this hieroglyph here, represents a nose, kissing with the nose, so to speak, uh, like Eskimos, His Majesty would let him, that is Tarshepsis, kiss his foot, not would His Majesty let him kiss the ground. So just to explain a few signs here, the, word for, the sign for ground is a stretch of land with three grains of sand. That's the nose again, for the, you know, to, as part of the word kissing. And this lovely sign here, with arms extended outward, are of course a nice expression of negativity. So again, in more uh, freely translated, the king would not allow Tarshepsis to kiss the ground as other courtiers would normally do. Tarshepsis was allowed to kiss the king's foot. Now this may seem ridiculous to us, but we need to realize, of course, that to the ancient Egyptians, the king was divine or half divine. So direct contact with the king, of course, was very unusual. We've got some questions, Matel. Yeah. From the hieroglyphs, I mean, uh, the hieroglyphs tell us uh, who the monument was made for. So, uh, you know, you get all the man's titles, his name, uh, often filiation, you know, his, parent, his parents and so on. Uh, from representations, such as the one at the top left, we can also easily tell that this is not a king, but a high official. Because 
this individual doesn't wear the typical royal attributes, such as the, the, the pleated headcloth that we saw at the beginning with the, the black seated statues. Uh, he doesn't wear a royal beard. He doesn't have the protective cobra on the forehead. He doesn't hold any typical royal attributes. He's holding a staff and a handkerchief, but he's not holding, for example, a crook or a flail or other typical uh, Egyptian symbols of kingship. <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, well, that's an ongoing debate, really, and, um, you know, it, it all depends on new evidence being found all the time. They, they, they are very closely together, in, in, and we, we, we will never quite know for certain who were the very first. Right, well, we will continue to the next great period of Egyptian history, uh, entering now the Middle Kingdom, and we'll focus... Um, on three statues of a king named Senwosret, Senwosret III. Um, these statues were created in the 19th century BC, and they are particularly remarkable for the, uh, the, the way the king is portrayed. Again, portraying must be taken with a, a, a pinch of salt. These are not true portraits, but a new ideal was established at this time. The king is no longer represented as a as a youth with idealized features, he's actually looking with rather careworn features, features of age, um, um, eye bags, deeply set eyes, uh, furrows along the cheeks, um, furrows on his forehead. Now, the question is, of course, why is the king represented in such a human way? It, were the Egyptians no longer interested in idealizing the king. Well, one might in fact suggest that this is still a form of idealizing, but with a different underlying notion of, of, for example, wisdom, which can only come with age. So the king is represented, he may look careworn, but he's in fact taking his responsibility of kingship very seriously. He's a wise man, an experienced man, and all that, of course, can only come with age. But as I mentioned, um, as these are not true portraits, it's not surprising to find that even private sculptures from the period show exactly the same sort of face. So again, it's all about a, a new template of representation. Unless there are any questions, we can carry on. Um, on to the next great period of Egyptian history, the New Kingdom, and we are focusing here on a colossal head and belonging arm, uh, these were once part of a very tall statue carved out of red granite. And again, as it happens, we are dealing here with King Amenhotep III, who was also uh, the man who commissioned the lion statues and the, uh, the black seated statues that we looked at at the beginning. Um, this statue showed the king striding, not seated, and we have to remember that the arm shown here, his left arm, as well as his right arm, which is still in Egypt, were actually held by his sides, hanging straight down. Um, the king, um, the, the statue uh, of which the body is still in Egypt, in fact, um, originally stood in a temple dedicated to the goddess Mut, Mut being the, uh, the concert of, of the god Amun-Ra. Um, so yeah, the, the body is still there. There's, there's in fact, originally there was a second statue that served as a counterpart to this one. The two actually flanked a temple doorway. Uh, fragments of the second statue, as it happens, are also in the British Museum. They are not on display. Um, but um, that statue was also a bit smaller. This is by far the most impressive uh, piece of work. Um, as we look at the head, uh, we'll notice, again, that there's a protective cobra on the forehead. Unfortunately, the head is missing, but otherwise it's quite distinctly a snake. And the crown that the king is wearing is, in fact, a double crown. It's a combination of two crowns, representing Upper and Lower Egypt again. So, again, we are dealing with a ruler of a unified country. Right, well... Um, there's a lot more to see in this gallery, and we can't possibly in this segment cover everything, nor all the great pieces available. 
Um, but you have to imagine that there's another stretch. The, the other half of the gallery deals with the following periods all the way up to the period of Greco-Roman rule. In the distance, you can see a large bust representing Ramesses II, uh, another great ruler of Egypt who ruled no fewer than um, 67 years. Um, you can also see some temple columns in the distance, also from his reign, or at least appropriated in his reign. In fact, those columns are older, but he recarved that decoration. Um, but finishing with the Greco-Roman period, what we've got right here, probably the most famous exhibit in the British Museum, is the so-called Rosetta Stone. Um, the stone was, in fact, a beautifully complete carved um, stela, um, 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 a sort of monumental stone with a cursed top, probably. And um, it's named after, its, uh, after the site of discovery, Rosetta, or El Rashid in Arabic. Um, what is remarkable about the Rosetta Stone is that it contains a text in three different scripts, not three different languages, three scripts, two languages. One language being Greek, uh, ancient Greek, which of course is a language scholars already mastered when this stone was discovered. This was discovered in uh, 1799, by the way, during Napoleon's attempts to invade and conquer Egypt. The other two scripts are Egyptian. At the top, we have the hieroglyphic script, which is reserved for monuments, sacred monuments, and in the middle, we have the uh, Demotic script, which was a more everyday kind of script used by literate Egyptians. Um, what few people actually know is what the content of the, of the text is. After it was deciphered, thanks to the Greek uh, readability of, sorry, the readability of the Greek text, uh, it was learned that we are actually dealing with a decree, a decree in honor of King Ptolemy V, um, he ruled, or he came to the throne around 200 BC. He was actually a boy king. He was still very young when he was put on the throne. And the text actually documents um, benefits bestowed by the king to uh, the, the priesthoods of Egypt. And in return, the priests granted him a, a, a royal cult. You know, he was deified already in life. 